Uh, so after the, the inspiring uh, words by the, the, the Vice Chancellor, um, I, I need to start with a disclaimer. I'm very cynical. Uh, so those of you who are prone to depression, please leave the room. Um, I end with a message of hope. So. Right, so Bratislava Declaration um, was something that was um, put together by the European Commission and the um, Slovakian Presidency of the European Union uh, last year. Uh, I was involved in, in writing it, um, and I'll tell you a bit about it. Um, the run-up to, to the declaration, uh, then focus on the declaration itself, what it means, etc. Uh, and then what's going to happen in the future, what's happening already, and what's, what's going to happen in the future, and what your role could be in, in, in promoting the declaration. Uh, so this is the, the team that wrote the declaration. Um, so as you can see, you've got uh, people from different countries, that's the nationality, not necessarily the place of work. So for example, I'm working in the UK, not in Portugal. Um, and, uh, you know, also it was very diverse in terms of experience and age, right? Uh, here a judge, for example, is a high school student who won an innovation award. And uh, fortunately, I'm not the oldest uh, person in the list, surprisingly enough. Uh, Bruno is actually uh, a professor in Spain, so, you know, these people that essentially have been involved in um, uh, research uh, advocacy roles to some extent, but not all of them. Uh, so there's a lot of diversity here, but I think that was, that was the goal. So how, essentially the uh, Slovakian presidency thought about, uh, de they dedicated their uh, presidency to, to research careers, and they thought about, you know, putting together this, this declaration of young researchers. Uh, so together with the European Commission, they assembled our group. Um, and we had a uh, first meeting in, in March 2016. Uh, that was in-person meeting in Brussels and so on. And then we uh, worked on the declaration remotely. And we were given com complete freedom to write whatever we, we, we wanted. The only restriction was, was that we, we must keep it to two pages. Okay, so you'll see actually there's a lot of things missing, as you would expect. But I think what we tried to do is focus on the issues that we felt were more pressing at the moment to solve. So uh, you'll see also a lot of parallels with what uh, with things that Katie has, uh, has mentioned in the Concordat. And in fact, some of the issues that we mentioned in the declaration have been coming around for 10, 15 years or even more. Okay? And the reason why they're still there is because they haven't been solved. Uh, so after writing the declaration, we had a first draft and we had a first public presentation in a, in a, in a workshop organized again by the Slovak presidency. Uh, there was a uh, presence of lots of different stakeholders, which is uh, Brussels keyword, if you're not familiar with it, means people who are invested in, right? So people who are invested in research means research funders, universities, politicians, etc. So there's feedback. Uh, to us from that meeting. We uh, edited the Bratislava Declaration and was ready finally in July, where it was presented at the informal meeting of ministers responsible for competitiveness. That means basically research ministers from across Europe. Uh, I was lucky enough to be present, we, we, to, together with two colleagues, uh, presenting the declaration to the, to the, to the ministers. Uh, it was quite well received, as these things normally are by politicians, and then they go out and they do their stuff and, you know, nothing happens. So, uh, interestingly, uh, the, the whole point was that the Bratislava Declaration was appended to the Council Conclusions of uh, November of, of 2016. So the Council Conclusions are uh, a bigger, chunkier policy document prepared by the, the Council of Ministers uh, outlining actions in response to the Bratislava Declaration. Okay? Uh, and so what I'm going to try to do within the Big, large part of my talk is contrast the two documents because I think you know when I, when I was putting together this talk, I actually started to look at the two documents and I thought mm, this is going to be really interesting because apart from anything uh, else, you get a, a bit of a lesson in how politics works. Right? I certainly did. So first of all, the council conclusions is called measures to support young researchers, raise the attractiveness of scientific careers, and force an investment in human potential in research and development. So, um, no econ economy on words there. Uh, you can see uh, where this is going. Right? Okay, so let's start with the declaration. So, what we did was we essentially divided the declaration into four aspirations. Okay, so the idea was to be positive, not cynic like I am normally on a day to day basis, but actually think about what researchers aspire to. Okay, 
And within each of those four aspirations, we had some uh, sub-points, more concrete points that we wanted to, to, uh, to enhance. So the first aspiration is enabling great people and ideas. So enabling people to fulfill their curiosity and their ideas and their enthusiasm for research. Okay, so how do we do that? So one thing we suggested was think about funding. Okay, the Vice Chancellor mentioned funding. Uh, and uh, we do have a system which works on some levels and fails tremendously on many other levels. And you know, we already started to discuss, discuss some of them. But why do we have to be content with the funding schemes that we have? The funding? Why, why can't we question whether it is really serving research endeavor and the research community, community and, and young researchers in particular? So after thinking about this, we proposed radically reorganizing funding streams to trust and empower young researchers, enabling them to pursue their ideas. So the conclusion that we came, and it was very much unanimous among the, the researcher uh, team, was that uh, we have currently an economically driven, impact-focused, bureaucratic system, and that's not compatible with uh, fresh ideas and fresh thinking, which normally uh, in, you know, uh, move researchers forward. Uh, so, the response of the Council Conclusions is, is there, okay? and it's interesting to see the difference in language, if nothing else. So the Council calls upon the Member States to encourage the national funding agencies to consider analyzing if and how funding schemes can be improved. Right? I'll, I'll repeat that again in case you, you can get it. Encourage agencies to consider analyzing if and how funding schemes can be improved. That's a far cry from radically reorganizing funding streams, isn't it? It's not going to happen. Okay, next. Uh, the other thing that we, we thought about was uh, in terms of education, okay? Incorporating education into scientific education, scientific, scientific thinking from the bottom up, right? From really early school and try to, uh, you know, enforce rational thinking and scientific literacy and so on. And so, of course, that, has to, that goes beyond the research, uh, research community in a, in a large, to a large extent. Uh, and so that was basically the, the suggestion is to reform curriculum methods of assessment for students to be given the opportunity to, to engage in scientific thinking and research, not just listen to, to people think, talk, talk about it. And I think that actually was uh, taken on board by the council uh, to some extent. Uh, so they, they have a uh, higher education modern, modernization agenda going forward and they are going to revise it in light of the, the recommendations. Okay? And they consider strengthening science education in all types of the world. Okay? Uh, so this seems to be something that actually may be moving forward uh, within the near future. Um, okay. Third point, again, related to funding, but a bit more concrete. Okay, so this is now about creating effective funding schemes for young researchers to become independent in their careers. Okay, so I think that the, the, the underlying idea here was to create something like ERC junior grants, right, for, for um, university undergraduate students or even uh, high school students that have like uh, interesting ideas to be able to start engaging in research right from a, from a young age. And this is something that's kind of a concrete thing that's, uh, that can generate headlines. And so politicians just jumped on it. So I think this is probably going to happen quite soon, in fact. Uh, they're suggesting rethinking this within perhaps the Marie Curie um, program, or even um, in conjunction with ERC, creating something like ERC Junior Grant. Right? So this is, this is something that, that actually might, might happen. Uh, we come to the second aspiration. Okay, so the first is more about uh, about funding and direction of research, where is research going, and scientific uh, thinking. Uh, now we come to sustainable and transparent career trajectories. So again, Katie's mentioned a lot uh, about this uh, stable and um, you know rewarding, recognized jobs. So of course, point uh, point one in this aspiration is to realize employment stability. Okay, with explicit career, uh, career progression criteria. So the whole idea here is to create something like a research, a research career framework on the side of the academic career, integrated in the academic career. It doesn't really matter. It just has to be something that affords the possibility of people uh, maintaining a, a stable career pro position with the opportunity of progression. Okay? Now, unlike what the, 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 the Vice Chancellor was saying, I've never heard a young researcher uh, advocate jobs for everyone, permanent jobs for everyone. 
we do recognize it's something that has to be competitive, has to be in, in, you know, embedded in the system we have. But at the moment, if you want to, do a, to have a research career, there's very few places where you can actually have something that's long term. Okay? In the UK, you have to go into the academic career, or in a very few number of cases, you go to, into, into an NGO or, to, or, or, or a, um, you know, a private research, research institute. But these are very, very, very few opportunities, and we don't really have an integrated research career. So, um, the Council cons uh, calls upon the Member States to consider establishing more permanent positions, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, it's all, it's all, it becomes all about recruitment, okay, which is not the point. Okay, open recruitment is important, but we're talking about career stability and so on, and going forward from that. Uh, but all of a sudden, the language shifts to recruitment, and then all of a sudden down here, you talk about training, career development, okay. All of these things, don't get me wrong, these things are all important, but that was not the point. Okay, the point was that there are many, many countries, most countries, where there's not an opportunity for stable research careers. Okay? And that's not, not been answered. And which leads us to think that it's not going to happen very time, many times. Uh, okay, this is similar but, but, uh, but different. Recruiting permanent staff researchers. Okay? Again, that has to do with, the, with creating more conditions for stable positions. Uh, and also better, better mechanisms for mobility between public and private sectors. Okay? Now this is something that I think at the European level, at the very least, people are really uh, picking up on. Uh, and in fact, in the preamble of the Council conclusions, um, it is stated that uh, early stage, stage career researchers need to be supported uh, and offer them attractive career development opportunities, including in intersectoral international mobility to and from the private sector. Okay? So this is something that actually I think is going to be picked up by um, um, by politicians quite soon. Uh, however, this um, last statement is quite interesting. Calls upon early stage researchers to share responsibility in managing their own career paths to be the ambassadors of transformation, the scientific development brings to society, blah blah blah. Uh, so I think the idea here is to somehow try to shift the responsibility towards researchers of achieving this kind of thing. I mean, Again, researchers, like Katie mentioned, need to um, have responsibility for their own career developments. But if the framework is not there, there's very little that the researcher can do. Okay. Uh, 2.3 uh, is about training and career development. The UK, to a very large extent, is leading the way, has been leading the way, in terms of career development of research staff. And a lot of the European countries, I think, are learning from that. And uh, in fact, there's um, there's very specific stuff about here about the new skills agenda for Europe. And so it is something that actually uh, European institutions are picking up on, and we're, we're we're likely to see a lot of improvement in this area. So we're halfway there. We have third aspiration. Uh, that's about the research environment. Okay. So the first thing is that we propose is supporting an EU-wide equality and diversity charter. So the idea was having something like an Athena Swan for Europe, but not only extending that to other underrepresented groups, ethnic minorities, disabled, etc. Okay, so having something more general uh, framework. Uh, and the response was, in, our, in my opinion, quite weak. Okay? Uh, so they call upon member states to promote best practices and policies to seek to dismantle barriers to the advancement of women in research, so again, only gender is mentioned, that's the first thing, whereas we had in mind something much more broad. Uh, and it's just about promoting best practices and policies, that's a lot weaker than what we have already in the UK. Okay? So I think, I suspect there is some resistance here from some member states in enforcing these sort of uh, equality charters. So the jury's out on this one, I think it's a quite, quite a powerful message. Uh, and. And countries like the UK are actually putting some pressure, or were even before Brexit, putting some pressure on the European institutions to move forward on this. Uh, so we don't know exactly what this uh, Empowering researchers to act on ideas that span traditional disciplines. So this is about multidisciplinarity, okay? But it's not only about writing on paper that, you know, multidisciplinary proposals are encouraged, right? That's pointless. It's about rethinking the way 
uh, academia and research uh, environment, the research funding environment is structured in order to actually enable multidisciplinary science to take place. And the response was absent. Okay? I scoured the document, there was absolutely no mention of multidisciplinary research or anything about, about restructuring the way uh, things are organized. Uh, point three. Develop policies that enforce free sharing of data and ideas. Katie mentioned that, open access publications. Again, the UK is a major driving force in this, in this sense. Um, you know, I think we all, you all know about this, the enforcement of research uh, of UK funders to uh, promote open, open science. Uh, but also ethical behavior. Okay, identification of individual contributions, post-publication peer review is a series of measures that we can, we can think about to promote uh, ethical and uh, eth ethical research and research integrity, and I was very very happy to see uh, from Katie's uh, results of the survey that a lot more young researchers are becoming interested in receiving training in ethics and integrity, because we, we strongly believe this is a, this has to be a major part of, of the future of research, partly because of the massification. We have so many people working on research, so many papers. It really becomes very hard for um, you know, self-regulation to take place. Okay, so we need to have some more structures in place. And guess what the answer was? Oops, nothing. Okay. So uh, again, I think this is something that has to be pushed forward quite strongly. Uh, we come to the fourth and last aspiration. Okay, work-life balance. Now we think that, uh, and you all probably share that idea, that if you don't have a satisfactory life in general, you won't be able to do good research. You'll be worried about other things. So we have to see the system as a whole, okay? And support people in all aspects of their life. Uh, so we touched upon a few examples, right? This is again not exhaustive. There's again a lot, a lot of things that are missing. For example, we didn't touch on pensions, okay? Uh, and the reason was, it was very strategic, the reason was the European Commission is already promoting the, the, the uh, EU-wide pension scheme that they've put, put together, Resaver. If you don't know about it, check it out. Uh, it's by no means perfect, but it's a very, very important step, step forward in, in uh, allowing people to have movable pensions if they move countries. So we didn't mention it because it's already being picked up. Uh, what's not really been being tripped up is uh, universal childcare provisions, parental care, flex flexible working practices, dual career opportunities, etc. So there are no real, there, there's, there's pockets, uh, particular institutions, particular regions that actually put in place these measures, but it's by no means across the board. Um, the only thing I could find related to this was uh, encouraging universities to give more freedom to early stage researchers with the aim of finding a better balance between research and teaching work. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe that wasn't in response to this point, I'm not sure, but I couldn't find anything else and that was the best I could do. So you can see the, the divergence between the, the politicians' uh, point of view and the, the, that of the people who are actually on the ground. Uh, facilitate and equally reward diverse forms of mobility. Um, this is mainly with a, with a wider view uh, to see that not every researcher can be physically mobile. Okay, there are family restrictions that people experience, other forms of restriction. And so we, we think that actually mobility should not be restricted to physical mobility. And in fact, at the EU level, people have been talking about this for, for a while. So unsurprisingly, uh, this, this is, you know, the response is almost, uh, almost verbatim what we had, what we had before. So, so this is something that uh, is moving forward. Uh, okay, so that was the declaration. Okay, that was the response of the council. So what, what's happening, uh, what happened after the declaration? So we created a petition which you, you can sign, that's the link. Uh, it didn't really pick up a lot of momentum. We have about 600 uh, signatures. I don't really know why, but you know, you can help by signing that if you want. Uh, we've done a few public presentations uh, like mine, hopefully better because I didn't do that many. Some of my colleagues did, did some, so they're, they're a bit more articulate. Um, and this is a very important point. There's an ongoing consultation at the EU level to shape the next framework program. So Horizon 2020 is coming to an end in 2020, as you expect. And they're already thinking about the, the next framework program. Okay. So there's an online, uh, an online, no, an ongoing consultation by the European Commission. 
There are many, many mechanisms for this consultation. A lot of them are informal, so that it's by invitation. They invite groups to discuss this. And so it's, it, it's not guaranteed that you'll get a voice on this. But my message is, if you are questioned about this, really do try to uh, you know, contribute your own opinions and try to, try to push you, you, you know, the postdoc and the, the early career researchers' agenda because this is mainly going to be dictated by uh, you know, people in, in very high positions of management, university leaders, you know, and it's, it would be really important for the European Commission to have the view of researchers on the ground, 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 uh, ground based research. Uh, in preparation for that, we conducted a, a, a res uh, survey in, in collaboration with some other uh, organizations. Um, it wasn't as rigorous as the VTI surveys, to be honest. Um, but there's a reasonable spread of, of respondents, gender balance in a lot of, a lot of different countries. And I'll just touch upon a few uh, items that were, that were flagged up. So when asked what are the barriers for young researchers, so not surprisingly, a lot of the issues that I've mentioned came up. And the biggest problem is short-term confidence. So as the Vice-Chancellor said, it's probably the hardest problem to solve, but it's also the biggest problem. Okay? So I think we need to take that into account. And of course, the, the second one was family work-life balance. Also unsurprising. These, these issues have been known for years. Okay? Now it's a question about how, how we solve them, how we put, put in place uh, measures to solve this. Uh, and this is interesting because the, the Horizon 2020 is built around societal challenges. Okay? Uh, and so, one of the questions asked in the survey is, what do you think are the future societal challenges? And the, the responses, I think, were quite surprising. A lot of people mentioned issues related to citizenship, ethics, rights, and democracy, right? Which doesn't figure in, in Horizon 2020 almost at all, okay? So it's interesting to see that people are concerned about other things that sometimes elude, you know, the, the politicians in, 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 in the big rooms in Brussels. Uh, and, and so I think we can inform the development of this framework program in a, in a, more, uh, in a more consistent way, perhaps. Um, and I've already said all of that, basically, okay? So the point is, at the moment, if you have the opportunity to make your voice heard in terms of, of the shaping of a new EU, EU, EU program, I know that with Brexit there's a lot of uncertainty of whether the UK is going to actually participate in that program or not, but in any case, you know, there's a lot of good practice in the UK uh, that can be actually um, enforced at the European level. So we should, we should be pushing for that. Uh, and more generally, and I think that's the, 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 the message is, is exactly the same as the Vice-Chancellor. Engage and become organized. And even individually, you can engage with science policy activities and try to make things change for the better. Okay, thank you very much for your time.